have a copy of the Word of God turn to the book of Luke this morning. The book of Luke, we'll look at Luke and John and the book of Acts. Uh, just a little. The book of Luke, first of all, if you turn to chapter 44, verse 49. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Now, if you turn to the book of Acts chapter 2. Verse 1. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared unto them divided tongues as of fire, and set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And then if you turn with me to the book of John, chapter 16. <clears throat> Chapter, verse 5, chapter 16, verse 5. But I go away to him who sent me, and none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I say these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is, it is expedient or to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper or the comforter will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come... He will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own authority, but... Whatever he, whatever he hears, he will speak. He will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will, take of, he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. And all things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I say that he will take of mine and declare it unto you. As we look at these texts this morning, uh, we find, first of all, in the book of Luke, well, whenever Jesus Christ was coming to the end of his earthly ministry, he commanded the disciples after the, basically the resurrection and going uh, to his ministry had been fulfilled on earth. Jesus said to his disciples, tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Jesus Christ knew that it was necessary uh, for the disciples to witness the power of God, the power of of the Holy Spirit before there can ever be the proper witness that they ought to be. In the book of Acts, we see whether this promise was fulfilled. The disciples were discouraged. They were despondent. They were dejected. They basically had lost faith and lost hope. When suddenly the Holy Ghost came upon that little band of believers that was in the upper room and came upon the day of Pentecost to the thousands that witnessed the preaching of Peter whenever 3,000 were, sa 3, were saved and basically the church experienced something that they had never experienced before. After the Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, we find in the second, third, fourth, fifth chapter of Acts and on through the book of Acts are several words mentioned often, and that is this, that they were amazed and they wondered. They were amazed and they wondered, such as it was when the lame man was healed in the temple gate. The Word of God says that there was much amazement and they greatly wondered about the works of God. I say to you this morning that there, in many instances, there's not much amazement or not much wonder left in the church of the living God. And I believe the reason for it is 
is because proper place is not given to the Holy Spirit. When he has control, when he's a running things, when he's a operating the whole business, I'll guarantee you one thing, there'll be excitement, there'll be, a, there'll be enthusiasm, there'll be wonder, and there'll be amazement in the services of the living God. Brother Danny mentioned this morning in Sunday school uh, about uh, the religion of the world and about how humanism has crept into the church and how uh, psychology has crept into the church and how that all of man's efforts has crept into the church and how that man is trying to condense and do so much. You know why that we turn to humanism and the psychology? It's because of the absence of the Holy Ghost of God. If God was present in the church working like he desires to work in the church, there would be no room nor need for anything else. And anything else that was introduced to the saints of God would be nothing but an insult to the church of the living God to even insinuate that we need someone or something to do anything save the Holy Ghost to do his work. And so what I want to talk to you this morning <clears throat> about <clears throat> is the third person of the Holy Trinity having his proper place in our life and his proper place in the assembly. We know that whenever he came on the day of Pentecost, the Bible said, first of all, they heard him. It was a sound as a mighty rushing wind. There, it was oh, the sound of a tornado though it was not the destructive force. Then the scripture said that they saw him. He came in the form of cloven tongues or in the form of a dove, in the form of a cloven tongue, whenever uh, he set upon them. And then the scripture declared that they began to speak and the word of God went forth. Every man hearing the gospel in his own language and they're going from Jerusalem to the uttermost parts of the earth with amazement and wonder to declare the work and the glory of Christ. There's one thing that I would like to say here, that after the day of Pentecost, and they began to preach the gospel and to evangelize, the emphasis was not placed upon the Holy Spirit, but the emphasis was placed upon the death, the, the crucifixion, and the resurrection, and the ascension of the Lord Jesus. They never boasted even of their Pentecostal experience, but they demonstrated their Pentecostal experience whenever they began to witness and teach the gospel of Jesus Christ. So first of all, I want us to look at the reality of the Holy Spirit. Glory be to God, folk, he is real. Jesus said he would come and said that whenever he comes that he would convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. When he comes, he will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He did come, and he is doing that. There's another thing that it said he would do, that he would guide you into all truth. Hallelujah. Ladies and gentlemen, no one can guide us into the truth and to the revelation of the Scripture save the Holy Ghost of God himself whether it be through the preaching of the word, through a Sunday school teacher, through the testimony of the saint, it takes the Holy Ghost of God to reveal the truth unto us. And then he said he would do something else. He would show you things to come. And then he said he will glorify Christ. And then he said he will take the things of Christ and show it unto you. <coughs> and you know, really, that's what we need done every time we come to the house of God. We need to be convicted of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. We need to be guided into all truth. We need revelation of that which God is doing. We need Christ glorified, and we need the things of Christ revealed to us. And that is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now, as I said, first of all, we see the reality of the Holy Spirit. Folks, he is real. He is a person. So often, you know, folk so minimize the person of the Holy Ghost. Jesus said, whenever I leave, I'll send another comforter just like myself. He'll come and take up my ministry. 
and carry on that which I have begun. He is real. You know, it's amazing. Even in society, in our society, with so much emphasis placed upon the Holy Spirit, how that so many people refer to him as an it or as a something. I'm telling you this morning, folk, I'm not talking about an it. I'm talking about the third person of the Godhead, him who is none other than the Holy Spirit himself, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus said to the disciples, it's necessary for you that I go away. But whenever I go away, I'm not leaving you orphans. I'm going to send another just like myself. And whenever he is come, on the day of Pentecost, he did come. When Jesus came in the world, he came, without, he came in the world, God manifest in the flesh, Mary provided him a body. And God inhabited that body and lived in tabernacle among men. In the person of Jesus Christ, God was revealed to the world because never before had God clothed himself in human flesh and never before had men been able to see God. But in Christ, people could see God. Jesus said, if you've seen me, ye have seen the Father. Because people could not see God because he was spirit. But when God came in body, God, Christ was able to reveal God to the world. When the Holy Ghost came on the day of Pentecost, he came without a body. He came as spirit. And the reason why that he came without a body is that he intended for you and I to provide a body for him to inhabit. And therefore, if we are saved by the grace of God, these bodies of ours are temples of the Holy Ghost. We are God's house this morning. God doesn't live uh, in tabernacles of stained glass windows, but we are the tabernacle of the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost came and took up residence within us, and he took up residence within us to continue the very work of Jesus Christ, and that is to reveal God to the world. And any man who's spirit-filled, that's filled with the Holy Ghost, I say to you without question, that individual is revealing Jesus Christ to a lost and dying and perishing world. So when the Holy Spirit is come, the Word of God declared that he will take up habitation within us. The very moment that we were saved, we were born to the Spirit of God, into the family of God. The Holy Ghost placed us into the body of Jesus Christ and took up residence within you and I. Took up residence to make Jesus Christ real to our life. So every saved person this morning is inhabited by the Holy Spirit. But I say to you this morning, every saved person is not controlled by the Holy Spirit. He's taken up residence, but he's not in control. And that's the reason why we have lost the wonder and the amazement in the church. You know, if we was to come together and the Holy Ghost in absolute control of the saints of God, of the believers in worship, it would be amazing. It would be the wonder of God in the church and without the church. The word of the Lord said when they came together that they rehearsed all that God had done. You know what a worship service ought to be, folk, when we come together as believers? We ought to just simply be able to come into this church service this morning because of the fact that the Holy Ghost has controlled us all week and God has worked wonders through our life all week in bringing sinners to Christ and strengthening the saved. I'll tell you, administering the Word of God that whenever we come together, what we ought to do is just come to rehearse all that God has done. Is that right or wrong? It ought to be amazing. It ought to be a wonder to come and just see the body of believers as they come together rehearsing what the Holy Ghost has done. But you know the whole truth of the matter? Most believers are living sad lives. They're living discouraged lives. They're living defeated lives. They're living dejected lives because of one reason. They have never appropriated by faith the power of the Holy Spirit that Luke talked about in that verse that I read to you just a moment ago when he said, Tarry in Jerusalem till you be endued with power from on high. 
So this morning, as a believer, the Holy Ghost takes up residence within us to make Christ known to us. And not only to make Christ known to us, but the work, the work of Christ in our heart and in our lives. We have heard it said so many times till I'm embarrassed to say it again. But you've heard it said a thousand times that it's absolutely, totally impossible for men in the energy of the flesh to do the work of God, that it takes the Holy Ghost to do that work. And though we preach it and though we talk about it, I wonder how many of us fully realize that this morning and has come to the place of such absolute submission that Christ can do his work in and through our life. I'm going to tell you, the only thing in this world that will shake this country is the power of the Holy Ghost. You know, whenever the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, the Word of God declared that the whole place was shaken. You know, it's amazing. Jerusalem was the religious center of the world, but religion hadn't shaken Jerusalem. I'll tell you, it was a place where the gospel had been preached, but yet Jerusalem had not been shaken. It was a place, I'll tell you, where it was all the religious hierarchy, but it, it had not shaken Jerusalem. But I'll tell you who did shake it. When the Holy Ghost came in control and in power, Jerusalem was shaken. And I'll tell you what, folk, religion won't shake the church of the living God today. Uh, preaching within itself won't shake the church of the living God today. I'll tell you what, if it would, this place would have been shaken to the foundation. Am I telling you the truth? There's been no absence of the preaching of the Word of God. You've heard some of the greatest preachers that's ever lived. But I'll tell you what it's going to take. It's going to take the power of the Holy Spirit. Whenever he has us in his hands to mold us, to operate in us, and to operate through us, we'll find the amazement and the wonder that there ought to be in Christianity. There is the reality of the Holy Spirit. And then there is the reason for the Holy Spirit. There was a reason for the coming of the Spirit of the living God. And John tells us what the reason was when he said it was the convict of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. You know, one evidence of the fact that the Holy Ghost is taking up a bold in us and living in us and controlling us is the fact that he ever, con he ever convicts of sin. I'll tell you what we need as much as we need anything else in the, in, in the church of the living God today. You know what it is? Old-fashioned Holy Ghost conviction of sin. Is that right or wrong? And whenever he has come, he will convict. I'm going to tell you something. If you're not constantly convicted, every time you falter, every time you fail, every time you sin against God, it could be because the Holy Ghost has never taken up residence in your life. Because when he has come, he will convict. And we need a revival of old-fashioned Holy Ghost conviction. You know, as Brother Danny said in Sunday school this morning, we have so compromised truth until there's no absolutes anymore. There's nothing black, there's nothing white, everything is gray. Basically, we've come to the place where that nothing is really sin anymore. You know why it is? It's because of the absence of the control of the Holy Ghost in the church of the living God. I'll tell you, when he's come, it'll be snow white, or it'll be as black and impure as anything can be. It won't be any in between. I believe that. When he has come, I'm talking about in mighty conviction, like we need him in the church of the living God. You'll say, well, preacher, why isn't he doing it? Because he's been grieved, because he's been resisted, because he's been disobeyed, because he hadn't been, he hadn't been given proper place. We have taken our own lives in our own hands, which means that we take his services in our own hands. And we leave him sitting on the sideline, saying, God, do something for us. But our very attitude toward God prevents him from doing it. When he has come, he will guide you into all truth. The reason 
for the coming of the Holy Ghost to guide us into all truth. When there is an absence of spirit control in the church, there's going to be an absence of the revelation of truth. Our folk read their Bibles, they read their Sunday school quarterlies, they read religious magazines, but there will not be the illumination of the truth that will conform men in the image and likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. But when he's come and taken control, he'll guide us into all truth. He'll glorify Christ. Thank God for it. That's the reason for his coming, is to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. Folk, we ought to be able to, uh, the, the, our very lifestyle ought to glorify and honor and magnify the Lord Jesus Christ. And whenever he has full control of our life, he'll do it. The reason for the coming of the Holy Ghost was to take the discourage, the defeated disciples, the faithless disciples, and I'll tell you, birth faith in them and give them courage and give them hope and give them expectancy and give them zeal, give them excitement, give them a determination to follow God at all cost. Isn't it amazing, Peter, who cursed and swore even at the accusation of one little girl that whenever he was filled with the Holy Ghost he stood on the day of Pentecost and he looked at rulers and governors and said ye are the one that crucified him and God raised him from the dead or oh, the boldness that Peter had after he was filled with the Holy Spirit you know he might have so little boldness to testify for Christ to witness for Christ you know basically in the church we come in like we're about half ashamed of him most of the time much less in the world is that the truth or not? Can't even get a holy grunt preaching on the Holy Ghost. But you know it's the truth. The reason of his coming was to empower the believer and the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. The reason of his coming was to so equip us that we would be adequate for any job that needs to be done in the realm of Christianity. You see, you know what we want to do? We want to blame the times for the problems that we have. Is that right or wrong? We want to say these are difficult days. We want to say it's different from what it was in the day of Finney. It's different from what it was in the day of Moody. It's different from what it was in the day of Jonathan Edwards. Sin is running rampant. And as we've said, there's no more conviction and, and everything has changed. But I'm going to tell you what. He came to equip the church and the believer for whatever they have need of in any given situation in any period of time. And so you know what that says to me this morning? That says that the Holy Ghost, I tell you, in the believer, and the believer in the church, collectively together or as an individual, that the Holy Spirit, he has come to empower us and to enable us and to make us capable for the job, to get it adequately done for the glory and honor of Jesus Christ. Do you believe that? If that's the case, the only reason why that the job's not being done is because we have ignored the Holy Spirit. We have resisted him. We have basically refused to let him have his way and to refuse to let him have absolute, complete control. Oh, we want the joy of the Holy Spirit, but we do not want the control of the Holy Ghost because of self. The reason for his coming was to make Christ known to our own hearts that we might make him known to the world. The reason for his coming was to be to us everything Jesus Christ was whenever he was in the flesh. Did you ever think about the days of our Lord whenever he walked this earth and say, you know, I would have loved to have been there whenever Jesus Christ performed the miracles, when Jesus Christ fed the mother. I would have loved to have been there and enjoyed the warmth of his fellowship and to heard him teach. I would have, liked to, I would have, I would have loved to have been in the company of Jesus Christ. I say to you this morning when the Holy Ghost has come, and taking up residence within us, he's come to make Jesus real to us and be to us everything that Christ is this morning. Is he that to you? That's why Paul wrote to the 
church of Ephesus and said, Be not drunk with excess of wine, but be ye filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, if it wasn't for the possibility of them not being filled, Paul would have never admonished the church of the living God to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, like I said, if you are saved, you are sealed with the Holy Ghost. He's taken up residence within you. But I'll tell you what, you need to be more than sealed with the Holy Spirit. You need to have the Holy Ghost controlling and running your life. I need the Holy Ghost controlling and running my life and making Jesus real to me in every situation and becoming adequate to me in every situation. That's why Paul said, It's no longer I that liveth, but it's Christ that liveth within me. Because Paul said, I've crucified the flesh. I've died to myself. And I've turned my life over to the Holy Ghost. And he's taking my life. And he's making Jesus Christ real to me. And he's making him sufficient to me in every situation. There's never an occasion, Paul was saying, when Christ is not sufficient. Because the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. And you know, this morning, the Holy Ghost can make Jesus sufficient for any need that there is in our heart and in our life this morning. There can never be a need arise in the life of the believer unless the Holy Ghost makes Jesus sufficient for that need in our life if he is in control. That was the reason of his coming. I'll tell you, to be the helper, to go along beside us, saying, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. And you know, if a man saved, Holy Spirit's always there. He's within. It's just a matter of the appropriation of faith in order to believe him and to trust him to do the work that needs to be done within our heart and within our life. All the reality of his coming, the reason of his coming, the results of his coming. You know, you look at the book of Acts. Do you know it's the only book of the Bible that doesn't have a conclusion? You know why? Because the book of Acts is the acts of the Holy Ghost, not the acts of man. And since the Holy Ghost of God is still acting, it won't be complete until Jesus Christ comes to rapture the church. You say, preacher, what I want in the church is excitement. I want amazing. I want amazement in the church. I want something to be amazed over. I want something that, well, that we have to wonder about. You know, something that's, that, 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 that's absolutely unexplainable sometimes in the church of the Lord Jesus. The Holy Ghost of God came in mighty power and filled them. And whenever God filled them, I'll tell you, there, instead of it being one Christ, they were all like Christ going out to evangelize the world, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, believing the word of God, all under persecution, yes. Many of them being tortured for their faith, yes. Uh, against adversity, yes. But I'll tell you, Christ was so real to them, they said we can't help but to name the name of Christ. And all Jerusalem was filled with their doctrine and they turned Jerusalem upside down. Why? Because of one reason. God, the Holy Ghost, was in control. You know, I've often thought about it. 120 believers turned the whole known world upside down with the gospel of Jesus Christ and filled the whole known world with their doctrine on the day of Pentecost as they won and made disciples out of others. And now you can have 120 churches, or I'd be afraid to say how many churches there is in East Baton Rouge Parish, but I know there's far more than 120. And most folk don't even know that we exist. Is that right or wrong? You know, I wonder if this church has ever been a threat to this community. I'm talking about as far as the world system is concerned. I wonder if they have really ever known that we have existed other than maybe to see a sign up on the road that we're having camp meeting or the sign up out here at the crossroads saying Milldale Baptist Church. Did you ever think about that? I mean, I wonder. I wonder if the, if the world ever wonders about us. If there's enough wonder and amazement and marvel in the church of the Lord Jesus that they ever wonder about what's even going on. You know the only reason why they don't? Because you and I are not full of the Holy Ghost. It's the truth. Because we're not controlled by the Holy Spirit. Because it's not that dynamo, that power, that dynamite. 
You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Same word that we get our word dynamite from. It'll be dynamite. I hadn't seen even any firecrackers, much less dynamite, Brother Danny. Maybe they'll be a little bitty going that you hold in your hand and light. And, but it said when the Holy Ghost has come, he'll be dynamite in the church. Power in the church. Reading the other day about the atom bomb when it was dropped in Japan. Said that one megaton was equal to, uh, took a hundred tons of dynamite, if I remember correct, to make one megaton whenever they tried to measure the atoms, the power of the atoms. You know, I think about the power of that atom bomb that was dropped and all the destruction that there was in it, the power that there was in it. But you know what? It was the same, that word mega is the same word that uh, we get our, also get our word power from. And you know, it'd be like for Jesus Christ to visit the church of the living God spiritually, I'm talking about the Holy Ghost to show up in the church. It ought to be such power because it would be as destructive on sin and destructive on self as the bomb that was dropped in Hiroshima. Is that right or wrong? It ought to be the same consequences in the church of the Lord Jesus, not dynamite. It ought to be a destroying power of evil influence and wickedness in the church of the living God. You know why folk can live in adultery in the church? You know why folk can live in wickedness in the church? You know why that folk can watch X-rated movies and read all the trash of magazines that there is uh, on the newsstands today? You know the reason why that folk can become so engulfed in that more, I'll tell you, than, than being engulfed in the things of God? You know the reason why that folk can live lewd and wicked and immoral and vulgarity everywhere in the world and conversation and dress and everything else? is a lack of the presence of holy God in the midst of us. It is a lack of the power of the Holy Ghost of God bringing conviction upon our heart. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible said when he's come, he will convict. There must be an absence of the presence of God and the Holy Ghost in the church because of the absence of conviction in the church of the Lord Jesus. There's never been as much immorality in the church of the living God as what there is today. And the sad thing about this, people who name the name of Christ don't even see anything wrong with it. Look at the Baker scandal on television. Man who acknowledged living in gross immorality. And 75% of his listeners this morning would turn a telecast back over to him and support him more than they've ever supported him. while well, they talk about the Holy Ghost ever broadcast. I'm going to tell you they're strangers to the Holy Ghost. He is holy. And he'll make a church holy. He'll make men holy. He'll make women holy. He'll make boys holy. He'll make girls holy. That was the reason for his coming. And when he has come, you know, Jesus said to the disciples, tarry until you receive power from on high. I don't think it's necessary today to have a tarrying meeting where a man tarries and waits for the Holy Ghost because he's here. I think you only need to wait until your life is surrendered to him. I don't know how long it'll take you, the power of the Holy Spirit, to bring self to death. In order that the Holy Ghost may take control, Paul said, it's no longer I that liveth, but it's Christ that liveth in me. I am crucified, yet I live not I, but Christ lives within me. And I'll tell you when the Holy Ghost takes control is whenever self is dethroned and he takes control of the heart. The whole problem with most folk is, is this, in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, his self is on the throne and there's no room for the Holy Ghost. He has no room. He cannot take position in our life because we have not given him the throne of our heart and of our life because self is there. This, this week doing a fresh study on self, all the curse of self and the character of self and the cure for self. There's not but one cure for it and that's death. 
There's not but one way in the world for the Holy Ghost to take control of our life and live the very life of God within us. And that is to take self off from the throne and nail self to the cross. Well, we can say with Paul, it's not I, but it's Christ that lives within me. And I'll tell you what that'll do. That'll do away with the selfishness. That'll take care of all the greed. That'll take care of all the lust. That'll take care of all the confusion and the chaos whenever self has been nailed to the cross and the Holy Ghost sits on the throne of our heart and begins to live on it and make Jesus real to us and not only real to us, but I believe he'll make him real through us. I'm going to tell you what. I believe any time that Jesus is real to a man, I believe Jesus will be made real through that man. He can talk about his experiences, his spirituality, all he wants to. But if Jesus is in control, Christ is going to come out. Boy, that says a lot, doesn't it? That says if we are filled with the Holy Ghost, it solves our temper problem. It says if we're filled with the Holy Ghost, it solves our greed problem. If we are filled with the Holy Ghost, it solves the problem of lust. If we're filled with the Holy Ghost, I'll tell you what, folk, we quit worrying about self having its way. And that's a whole problem, self, self, self. <laughs> I was reading in the book of Isaiah this week where Satan said, whenever he, whenever he was actually cast out of heaven, he said, I'll rise up, I'll do this, I'll do that, I'll do something. It was all I was Satan. And that's what made him the devil. Why Satan is the devil is because it was all I with him. Yeah. Can you do this, and can you do that, and can you do the other? Have you done this? And I'm not asking you to report on all you've done for the church, or in the church, or out of the church. I'm asking the question, as I ask my own heart, the question is, I did this morning and last night over and over again, am I full of the Holy Ghost? I had someone to come to me one day and ask me the question, said, Preacher, are you full of the Holy Ghost? I said, the very fact you had to ask is probably evident I'm not. If we're as full of him as we ought to be, folk would know it. They'd know that we know Christ. Are you filled with the Holy Spirit? I'm not asking if you've been saved, you've been sealed with the Holy Spirit, but I'm asking you, does the Holy Spirit have control of his house this morning, your tabernacle? This body is a tabernacle of the Holy Ghost. It's where God builds. To defy this body is to defile the temple of the Holy Ghost, not this church. You know, it's amazing. Folk wouldn't consider smoking in the church house. Say, well, I wouldn't defile the temple of God. You far better off smoking in the church house than you are to defile this temple. This is the temple of the Holy Ghost right here. We've got it all wrong. Men say, I wouldn't curse in church. I got news for you if Christ inhabits you. You are his temple. Wherever you do it, it's in his presence. You know, worse off to commit adultery in a church house than your house prostitution. It's all the same sin. Folks need to see the wickedness of it. Because these are the temples of the Holy Ghost. It's where God abides. And I'm asking a simple question this morning. Does God have control of your life? The reason for the Holy Ghost coming was to put mar was to put mystery and amazement and some marvel in the Christian life. The excitement in the Christian life, the wonder in the Christian life. And you know, probably the reason why today if you look at the membership of the enrollment of this church we probably don't have but maybe half the church members here today one thing and, and, and don't be too hard on them because the third of you won't, probably won't be here next Sunday but the whole issue is this why is it can't be but one or two reasons either they've never been saved and worship means nothing to them or they're not filled with the Holy Ghost and worship has lost its excitement and its wonder and its amazement. God are working like he ought to work. Folk wouldn't want to miss church service because they know they'd miss something. Is 
that right or wrong? Are you filled with the Holy Spirit? I'm talking about, is it he that runs your life? Are you controlled by the Holy Spirit? Be not filled with excess of wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be controlled by the Holy Ghost. If he can, if he can control you, he makes Jesus adequate in every situation in your life. He can take despair and turn it into rejoicing. He can take disappointment and turn it into gladness. He can take the emptiness and he can fill those empty places. He can make your life what it ought to be. He can give you a desire for the will of God when in the flesh you want to resist it and refuse it. Only can the Holy Ghost give you a desire for God's will and a determination to do it. You'll never have that desire in the flesh. Flesh rebels against God's plan and God's purpose and God's will for your life. That's why flesh has got to be crucified and the Holy Ghost enthroned before you'll ever have a desire to do his will. But I'll tell you what, when he's come in fullness, he'll give you a hunger and a desire to know and to do the will of God. And you can never be content with anything less than that. Shall we bow our head, we pray. When I ask you a question this morning, are you filled with the Holy Spirit? If you're not, oh, we could call, name a thousand things. It's all because of one reason. You're not willing. You're not willing to dethrone self and let the Holy Ghost take over.